This week on The Aviators, Curtis is going to look at different ways to land an aircraft. It's a plane that's shaped like a boat that kind of looks like a bee. We're exploring the Republic CB. And we'll show you how the simple location of your flight school could affect your training experience. Last season on The Aviators, you witnessed Motley Crue frontman Vince Neil training for his private pilot's license. Okay, for takeoff. Okay. Go full throttle. Vince's training took place at Henderson Executive Airport in Las Vegas, the location of which had a large impact on his training. The airport is in the desert, in a high traffic area near a major city, and has smaller airports nearby. If you're looking at obtaining a pilot's license, whether it be for recreation or if you're looking for a long-term career, it's very important to consider how the simple location of a flight school can provide you with many positive learning experiences. The FAA requires us to teach the students a variety of things, including night flying, cross-country flying. But here in particular, they get the added benefit of flying at a higher altitude, 5,000 feet here at Prescott. So. They get the high density altitude conditions, less dense air, high temperatures in the summertime, and all of that gives a student more experience with the performance of the aircraft. Alicia Tellefson is a flight instructor at the Prescott campus of Embry-Riddle. As an aeronautical university, students at Embry-Riddle will usually receive their pilot's license and additional ratings as part of a four-year degree program. With two campuses, one in Daytona Beach and one in Prescott, the university may be teaching the same courses in both locations, but the experience of the students is greatly impacted by the flight school's surroundings. This impact can be a result of many factors, from the geography around the airport, to the average air temperature, to the class or type of airspace. We have controlled airspace here, which is obviously where they do a lot of their flying, but around us, it's primarily uncontrolled. So Northern Arizona has a ton of airports and the majority of them are uncontrolled. In Prescott, they take care of you. It's a controlled airspace, so therefore the control tower will tell you what to do and how to avoid traffic. When you go into an uncontrolled airspace, you are responsible for yourself. It's always difficult to see other aircraft, but I'd say the hardest part is knowing that in an uncontrolled airspace, a pilot isn't required to be talking on the radio. So you, you have to be watching out for your own self. Michael is a flight student at Embry-Riddle who has so far completed his private pilot's license with an instrument rating. To accomplish this, Michael had to do a lot more than just fly patterns around Prescott and to fly to one or two nearby airports. Staying in a little bubble of Prescott, Arizona isn't going to get you anywhere in terms of a career, so you have to go out and see what it's like. And going into the busy airspace of the Valley in Phoenix sure taught me a lot about radio communications and just being on top of your game. There's so much that they learn from just being constantly talked to by someone or listening to other people, um, switching frequencies on a regular basis, listening to multiple frequencies. So it's definitely a lot busier and it requires more training and more experience. While well, Prescott students may have to travel a ways to experience densely populated airspace, in Daytona Beach, students are dealing with heavy traffic from day one. For the most part in the beginning, the instructor will take more of the communication and procedures part, getting inside and outside of Daytona Beach's airspace. And with the simulators, what's great about this is we can bring them in and go slowly through the procedures so the student understands, okay, after getting a clearance, I gotta to talk to ground control, after ground control, tower, after tower, departure. And he, he already knows what to say. By taking him out, it's not real world, so he's not, oh man, if I mess up now, it's, he's gonna start yelling at me. Another great thing, again, about Daytona Beach's airspace, once the student has that knowledge, 
He's equipped to operate in any types of airspace. It's so busy here that, you know, you're dealing with other aircraft with similar call signs. Uh, our fleet van itself, we have uh, Rudolf 462, Rudolf 463, and Rudolf 464. So when they get out to the real world scenario, they already know what to do um, getting out in and out of those air airports without a problem. I've uh, been to Sanford a lot of times, which was so much fun. I mean, here I am doing traffic patterns at an international airport. I had to overfly the airport and I looked down and there's a 767 landing below me. And I'll never forget, you know, here I am flying in this huge airport, seeing these international huge airplanes coming in and kind of being like, one day, you know, maybe I can fly that plane. So that was an awesome experience. Once again, even if you're looking to simply fly on the weekend and take your family or friends up on an airplane ride, you really want to consider when doing your training what sort of environment you're going to end up flying in. Florida can certainly provide fantastic weather for flying. The weather can also turn quickly, and anyone learning to fly in Florida will definitely get used to working around thunderstorms. But if you're going to find yourself flying in more northern areas, or even mountains, there's other factors you'll have to concern yourself with. And in the winter, we have ice and snow and frost on the aircraft when we come out to them. So we have to make sure that we get rid of that before we go flying. So we have a de-icing procedure in effect here. And in the winter, it's pretty much every morning that you can expect to have your aircraft de-iced before you take off. On the other side of the equation, by flying in mountainous terrain in the summer, students will learn to deal with the effects of density altitude. I'm from Syracuse, New York and I've done some flying with a friend out there. He has a Piper Cherokee, and uh, it's a completely different type of flying than out here. There's not a lot of mountains, so you don't have to worry about flying into them in Syracuse, whereas here in Arizona, high altitude as well as mountains are the danger. The warmer the temperature gets, the less the aircraft wants to climb, and if you find yourself in a position where you need to climb quickly in the middle of the summer, that might not be an option for you if it's too warm. Density altitude is something that all pilots will take into consideration prior to takeoff. The reason it's so important for us here at a mile high is it could prevent us from being able to take off on a hot day. If you've got high temperatures and you've got low air density, you might not have the performance to depart on a certain runway if it's short enough. Um, even a 4,000 foot runway, if you've got exceptionally high temperatures and high density altitude, you could risk uh, running off the end of the runway before lifting off the ground. Geography, weather, and the type of airspace are just some of the things to consider when learning to fly. Most private pilots flying recreationally will probably learn to fly close to or in the same area where they'll do a lot of their flying. But if you're planning to go anywhere and everywhere with your aircraft, or if you want to fly as a career, the more variations you see throughout your training, the better prepared you'll be. It actually makes it real for them. When you just read about it in a book or on a chart, it doesn't really affect you. But if you try to take off on a runway and it's not long enough, or you try to take off on a very hot day and there's not very good performance, and you see right there what happens to the airplane, and maybe even it scares you a little bit, you'll learn significantly more from that experience. And you'll actually take that knowledge with you for the rest of your career. 